Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Will Snyder. I'm a sales and charter broker with 26 North Yachts. This is our, our third webinar in as many weeks. And I do want to point out that our first two webinars are available on our YouTube channel. And this one will be uploaded shortly. Next week, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled time at Wednesday at uh, 10 a.m. For the first two webinars, the questions we've received through the, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen have been absolutely fantastic, and we, we definitely want to keep that trend going. So please uh, fire away during the course of this presentation, and we'll be sure to answer your questions. Today, we're, we're very pleased to, uh, to be joined by John Jarvie of Oversee Insurance. We work with John and his team a lot, and they're absolutely fantastic, so I have no doubt it'll be uh, an enlightening conversation with John. We're also joined by Mike Carlson, co-founder of 26 North Yachts. And for the next 15 or, or 20 minutes, Mike and John are gonna be having a lively discussion about coronavirus related insurance issues for yacht owners. And that'll be followed by a Q and A. And with that said, good, good morning, Mike. Good morning, Will, thanks. And uh, good morning, John, sorry about that. I had it on mute. Um, yeah, th good to be here and good to have John here. John, I must say your, your beard's coming along nicely, so well done. <laughs> Thank you. I was told I could only uh, sit in on this with, with you guys if I was part of the, the beard club here, like most of your offices, so I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as we get into it, so I, I think that, you know, I've had a lot of conversations here these past few weeks on with both buyers and sellers and, you know, current boat owners and talking about um, insurance has been, been a big, big topic. So, you know, obviously why you're here, John, and to kind of learn more about it. And I'll go through some of like the common questions that I see or that I hear from, uh, from existing owners that maybe you could fill us in and kind of give us some insight from, from an insurance standpoint. And just to kind of emphasize again, what Will said, John specializes in large yacht marine insurance, um, here, you know, based here in South Florida, as well as California. So I think it's a, it's a really good opportunity to learn more about the insurance side. So kind of diving right into it, John, one of the first questions that I hear frequently is, um, is should owners be concerned about whether or not they can leave South Florida if their policy mandates that they have to leave for hurricane season. So that's a, a, common, a common question or concern that I hear coming up pretty fre frequently now. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, but owners should be concerned or at least conscious of what's going on. I realize that it's still mid-April, we're not at hurricane season yet. And you know, a lot of our clients have more important things to handle than their boat. Um, their business, their family, their personal lives, maybe the boats are first priority, maybe not. But once they start thinking about the repercussions of uh, COVID-19 on their marine insurance, it is important to realize that once that date hits, that June 1st, June 15th, June, uh, sorry, July 1st, whenever your insurance company requires your boat to be north, uh, that's not just to have hurricane coverage, that's to have any coverage. So the best thing owners can do right now is start to look ahead, plan ahead, uh, look at where they're gonna be docking their boat in the summer, start to reach out to their marinas, Boston, New York, Rhode Island, make sure that they're gonna be able to get dockage up there and also look at the variables to actually get up there. Do you need to get a delivery captain, delivery crew? Do you need to get fuel? Is it, are you gonna be able to get fuel? Um, we had a, a client call last week with an 82 Hatteras who aren't certain that their captain is going to be able to make the delivery for them. Uh, and also, they're not sure they're going to be able to get fuel. And most importantly, they're not sure that their uh, marina, I believe it was Montauk Yacht Club, uh, when it's going to open and if it's going to open and if they're going to have a place to bring their boat. So uh, I think for owners right now, the best thing they can do is look at what their insurance policy says, what they're covered for, because you may be allowed to stay in Florida during hurricane season. This may not be a problem, uh, but if you are required to go north, whether that's to North Carolina, Newport, Rhode Island, Virginia, if you are required to go north and you think you might need to make a change, now is the time to get in touch with your insurance broker or your insurance company to see if they'll accommodate it. Because probably what's going to happen is as we get closer to June, uh, that those last couple of weeks of May are going to just be an 
overwhelming amount of owners who are going to be having these requests. So the earlier you can stay in front of it, the better chance you're going to have of finding a resolution that that's fair for both sides. And have you seen many boats start moving now, John, as far as, you know, what's, what's your experience been as, as far as reaching out to you or, or, you know, I, I, we've had a few boats more recently that have left that have started to head North, but what's your experience been? Um, we, you know, we're not, we don't track every boat. Uh, so I don't know when they leave, but I think a lot of them right now aren't in a huge rush. Isn't it still snowing up there? Yeah, and part of um, the concern is limited dockage just with um, with a lot of boats not going to the med for the season. So, you know, I, I think that's, or if there's further restrictions on cruising or, or what have you. Well, what owners need to realize too is that if you tell your insurance company you're going to be, say, in New York for the summer months, your policy won't require that you've got to be in New York. It'll say, the boat must be north of the Florida Georgia border or Cape Hatteras or Cumberland Island, Georgia. Every insurance company has a different location where they draw the line of where your boat needs to be north of. And if you need to be north of Florida, you've got a lot of space to look for dockage. It doesn't mean if Montauk Yacht Club doesn't open on time, I can't, there's no other docks. You can be in Georgia, you can be in Savannah, you can be in Cape Hatteras. There's a lot of places you can still go use your boat just because your home marina may or may not be open. So if you are if you can plan ahead to know that, hey, if I'm just north of the Florida Georgia border, I've got more time to figure out uh, my plans before I get all the way up to Boston or New York or Rhode Island. Um, or if that's too much of a, of a hassle to, to you know have that uncertainty, then to start the process now and say, well, what's it gonna take for me to keep my boat in Florida during hurricane season or in the Bahamas? You have to keep in mind, this is uncharted territory for the insurance companies, just like it is for the owners. We've never had to deal with anything like this before. The insurance companies themselves are trying to figure out how they're going to handle this, this wave of, of requests. Um, keep in mind, your insurer is not obligated, at least as of right now, they're not obligated to allow you to stay in Florida. They can say no, and they have reinsurers to report to. And their reinsurers kind of set the guidelines for the insurance companies themselves. So they, they don't have the ability necessarily to go from having $250 million of yachts in Florida to having a billion of yachts in Florida during hurricane season. So they can say no. Um, now there's other companies out there you can change insurers to find an insurance company who will allow you to stay. But again, if you wait until May 25th to make that phone call, you're, you're gonna run into trouble. I think mm -hmm. another another question that I'm getting is is for current boat owners is how do they handle um, captain and crew requirements in the event that the crew needs to leave to look after their own families? That's a good question. Um, we've seen this happen already. Uh, again, we've seen uh, obstacles with owners trying to get just simple delivery crew owners who are looking for a captain and crew for, for a larger vessel who are having trouble as well. Um, given everything that's going on right now. And keep in mind, there's, there's two different directions that your insurance policy will go. One is that you have a full-time captain requirement, meaning you've got one guy or girl who's your captain annually to look after your boat in Florida. And you can have that on a 60-footer, you can have that on a 160-footer, but it goes by what your insurance company requires. If you don't have a full-time captain requirement um, and you just have you know, part-time crew who left the boat, you're not violating any policy warranties or requirements. But if you've got a full-time captain, especially on a boat probably over 80 feet, it'll probably be required. If you're required to have a full-time captain and they leave uh, or they can't come to work for whatever reason or they want to stay home with their family, you are essentially violating the contract. So your, your contract requires that that full-time captain is employed. One of the major reasons that that is there is because of hurricane season. Insurance companies want big boats to have captains during hurricane season in Florida, but there are also a lot of different uh, risks to a vessel outside of hurricane season that having a captain there or full-time captain gives you the, the safety of knowing that the boat's in a little bit better uh, hands. So if your captain leaves or if you can't find a replacement captain, uh, make sure you get in touch with your insurance company. Again, these are unprecedented times. Uh, the, the, 
the luxury insurers of the world, your Chubbs, Travelers, AIGs, they're trying to figure this out too right now. And so the best thing you can do is be in touch. Let them know you're having a problem with your captain. My guess is they're going to value their clients enough. They don't want to lose all of their business just like we don't. So they're going to value their clients enough where they're going to want to work with them. They're going to want to accommodate and push through this, this storm together uh, and come out the other side and, and hold that relationship between insurance company and client. Yeah, so this, and that, that falls in line with, too, is just having like your, you know, starting to think about your hurricane plan and so forth. And, and also dockage needs. I think for where we're located in Marina Bay in Fort Lauderdale, given that we're four miles inland on the uh, off the New River, we have a little bit more protection than, say, in Pier, 60, Pier 66 right along the coast or some of the other marinas there. But that's what we're seeing is a, a big demand right now for dockage. Um, thinking ahead about hurricane season as well and having that hurricane plan in place. Yeah, you're absolutely, that's a great point. And so if you're going to go back to your insurance company and request to make a change, it would be helpful if you had your ducks in a row, so to speak, already. So if you're going to say, I'm supposed to be in uh, Rhode Island and I'm going to end up staying in Florida this summer, will you allow me to stay? They're going to say, well, what's your hurricane plan? Are you staying at Bahiamar or are you four miles up river at Marina Bay? that will be a, uh, a factor in them approving it or disproving it. And also having a hurricane plan itself. So your hurricane plan, everyone's filled out a hurricane plan before, but your hurricane plan is also what will get uh, approval or disapproval from the insurance company, depending on how well you're sort of presenting your case. Um, but insurers will also want to see that you have the ability to move it. Like that 82 hat, they said they weren't able to get fuel, so they're not going to be able to go north. I said, is that your only reason? We helped him get fuel. And then he said, well, no, actually, that's not my only reason. There's something else. So be straight up with the insurance company because they're going to want to help you find solutions. And if you find those solutions, whether it's dockage, hurricane, crew, uh, if you find those solutions and you still don't want to go north, they're probably going to be less accommodating. So give them all of your reasons for having problems initially, and then you guys can try to overcome those together. John, so while I have a, we're, we're, a question came up that's relevant to, uh, relevant to this topic is, uh, John, he asked, you're discussing Florida, but what about Houston, the impact uh, there as well? So Houston is also, I mean, the, the Gulf is also considered uh, a hurricane zone. So is the uh, Pacific coast of um, Mexico, Costa Rica, all the way down south. And you know, Cabo San Lucas has been hit many times over the last few years. Um, but in, in the Gulf, it's going to be very similar. The problem, though, is in the Gulf, you can't really go north. Most boats in the Gulf stay there. Uh, so if, if this individual's plan was to come around Florida and go north, then this is a similar conversation as you could that, that, that I mentioned before about having with your insurer. But if your boat is going to stay in the Gulf, the best thing you could do is prepare your hurricane plan and, and find appropriate dockage that will be the safest for your boat. Now, if your insurance allows you to stay in the Gulf year-round, then you're already covered there. You don't have to make any changes. But if, it, if it's your insurance requires you to be out of the Gulf in the summer months, then you should go through some of these uh, protocols to try to get approval to stay, if that's All what right. you want to do. Yeah, that sounds good. So another question is, what happens if a crew member gets sick with the coronavirus? And what are the, the, the owner's responsibilities, if any? Um, so I'm assuming this is American, American boats or American yeah, crew yeah. or American right. owners, right? Which tie this into the Jones Act, which is also American. Uh, when the Jones Act is involved, we, the insurance companies and the owners are liable for illness and injury to crew while in duty, while in service to the vessel. So if obviously you're captain or your crew member hits their head, gets injured, uh, it's, it's our liability, our obligation to maintain and cure that injury. Whether you have insurance or not, you are liable under the Jones Act. So the, the requirement is maintenance and cure, regardless of what type of, type of illness or injury that is. Now, if some owners, especially on larger boats, will purchase a separate insurance policy, a crew medical insurance policy, which is very similar to a health insurance policy that most land-based employers 
do for their uh, team, for their employees. So yachts can get these, uh, purchase these types of policies also, where you wouldn't necessarily be dependent on the yacht policy to cover uh, the illness or injury. You could use this medical policy, but the yacht policy covers it still. So COVID-19, if you had any crew members who fell ill to this specifically, it would be very difficult to prove where they got it, right? Were they at the movie theater? Were they at a nightclub? Were they traveling? Um, but even crew who are aboard a vessel and they run to the grocery store and come back to the boat, that's still in service to the vessel. So even if they got it at, caught it at the grocery store, that's still in service to the vessel. So the maintenance and the cure. So if, if for any owners out there, if any of your crew uh, catch this or, or are susceptible or are suspected to have caught COVID-19, you want to do everything in your power to take absolute care of them, help them with medical bills. Uh, your, your insurance company will help with that. But if things got really bad and we're on ventilators and we're, we're really having uh, problems, those medical bills are going to get really expensive. And so especially for boats with multiple crew, I mean, you don't have to think much about these cruise ship issues that just about everybody on board is getting sick. So it would be very similar on a large yacht, I think. Um, and if you had multiple crew members getting ill or God forbid passing away because of this, uh, that maintenance and cure, or if there is no cure in the event of a death, all of that would fall on the owner's yacht insurance policy. So you do, they do have coverage for that as long as they've got coverage for crew, li liability coverage for crew on their policy. But if you had a few really significant cases aboard the boat, you might, you might not have enough liability. Um, so that's something to consider. All right. So um, um, this will, uh, there's a couple of more questions that are coming up. One from Steven asking, can I reduce the number of crew without affecting my insurance coverage? And I think that's, that's um, leading into the next question, also talking about travel restrictions and preparing for hurricane season. But in addition to that, like what Steven is asking on reducing the, the number of crew without impacting insurance, what are the alternatives? Yeah, if someone like himself wants to reduce crew and, and get more involved with, say, a management company with a monthly, you know, monthly systems checks and so forth, what, are, what types of options would, uh, would he or she have? So, again, there are the, we need to consider the two types of policies here, the policy, insurance policies which require you to have crew, and then the policies where you actually you have co liability coverage for crew, but you're not required to have them. Right, the owner's approved to run his own 60 foot sea ray. He's not required to have crew, but he's got coverage for them. If he ever hires a chef, a captain, a, a stew. Um, in that case, you can get rid of those crew, you don't have to keep them. That won't be any issue with your insurance per se. But on the policies where you are required to have crew aboard, the, on bigger vessels, especially, you need to make sure you're not um, disturbing any of the regulations or the requirements of your flag state. That you're, you're, you know, if you're has a manning requirement, you need to meet that manning requirement. Sometimes that's in the slip, sometimes it's just underway, depending on the flag. But for insurance, because the insurance will require that you're in compliance with your flag state. But for insurance, more likely than not, if you've got a policy for a very competitive price because you have full time crew and you remove those full time crew, that same insurer might not. Uh, stay on risk might not continue to insure you. So as I mentioned before, there are other types of insurance policies that don't require full-time crew. It is much more expensive for that type of insurance. But if you look at it compared to the cost uh, to pay crew to be there, the insurance increase is probably worth it. Uh, and, and the idea of yacht management companies, part-time captains or caretakers all, all kind of get bundled together. Um, the yacht management companies aren't considered full-time captains per se in many cases, but a lot of the underwriters prefer to see a management company compared to my friend Joe at the dock is going to be looking after my boat. Uh, he's on the he's on the boat next to me at the marina. That's not as good as a management company. Um, but and I would think for, for obvious reasons, the, the management companies carry their own insurance and have professional crews and so forth with a little bit more accountability. Correct. Yeah, but every boat's different. And, um, you know, we, again, I'll, I'm going to say these are unprecedented times. Insurance companies are having to make decisions, marine insurance companies are having to make decisions they haven't had to make before, consider things they haven't had to consider before. 
and they're also approving things they've never approved before. We've got a, an, an 85 footer that was in Nassau last week and his crew left the boat. And this is a policy that requires a full-time captain. His crew left the boat and he didn't want to get stuck in Nassau. This guy, this owner is not approved to run his own boat, but sure enough, the insurance company approved him to, to run his own boat by himself from Nassau back to Fort Lauderdale because it was safer for the owner, safer for the boat, and the insurance company didn't want to have further issues down the road for not approving this trip. Um, now that owner still is not approved to run his boat, even, even though he's done it successfully, but they made an approval that I've never seen done before, ever. So keep an open mind, everybody. Keep an open mind and use a little bit of creativity uh, with your insurance broker when you're trying to get some of this stuff done. I'm not saying every owner should try to run their own 100-footer, but they, they are approving things that we've never seen approved before. So it's, it's worth having an open mind and, uh, and knowing that possibly everything's possible right now, but at the same time, nothing might be possible depending on your insurer. Yeah, so Sebastian has confirmed that some fuel stations going from Florida up north are closed. So I can speak on my own experience here in, in South Florida just with my own boating is that it's been interesting, like fuel, uh, fuel on the water is some days it's open, some days it's closed. It doesn't seem like uh, I think they're open right now. I'm meant to get fuel later today. Um, so I, I think they're open now, but it's been, it hasn't been consistent. I'm not sure the reason why they've been sort of open and closed. I do know an alternative to getting uh, fuel on the waters through a delivery service. So having, um, calling in a truck, which we have plenty of contacts for that as well. And that's a common thing to do and, and typically less costly than getting fuel on the water as well. So that could be an option. But as far as going up north, John, I think you had, or going back to uh, a conversation you had with a customer previously, who was having a hard time finding fuel up going north. Is that right? Yeah, that was the 82 Hatteras. I think he might actually be one of your, your customers uh, as well. But yeah, he called in and he was having trouble getting fuel. The boat's in Miami right now. He didn't think he was going to be able to get fuel to go north for the summer. And I made a few phone calls, including the BEMR, which is where our office is. Um, but what, what I learned is most marinas who sell fuel uh, only want to take care of their customers. So they, they don't want to take in boats that just cross the Caribbean, boats that are coming in from out of town, transient boaters who they don't know to sell 12 gallons of fuel. Um, they're, they're, so Bahia Mar right now has their fuel dock blocked on the, on the face dock with a, a big, big boat. Uh, and they're only selling fuel to people who are tenants at Bahia Mar, people who they know, or people who that they've worked with before. So for owners, if you've got any relationships with any uh, fuel docks, you might have to go out of your way to find it. Uh, it might not be convenient, but I think what's important for uh, fueling companies and marinas right now is that they know you, that you've worked together before and you have some type of relationship, even if, you if your boat's not docked there today, the fact that you've uh, you know, kept your boat. Do you guys have fuel at Marina Bay? We don't, but nearby, and again, so we typically have trucks uh, that will come to Marina Bay to fuel the boats, and like I said, it's, it's less expensive, so it's, uh, that has not been an issue here at our location, and they'll, they'll travel to, they'll go wherever they're, they're allowed to go into, behind a house. I believe it's essential, though, you know, it's, it's an essential. Uh, it is, and I'm, you know, I think that the reason for closing it on the water was, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, and I think that's why it's here in Fort Lauderdale, at least, um, on the water. has been some, some days it's been closed, other days it hasn't been. So even recently, I was, uh, <laughs> they were selling live bait and everything else was open in the marina, but they weren't pumping fuel for whatever reasons. They said they weren't allowed to. Then the next day they were, so it hasn't been, been consistent. But I think, yeah, I think it is essential. And like I said, a fuel truck's an easy solution. We're very fortunate being down here in South Florida and having so much access to all of these services that are there for the marine industry. And, uh, you know, I think we're just, we just take for granted how easy it is to get things boating related here. Uh, and, and it's just going to take a little bit more effort, whether you're looking for dockage or fuel or delivery captain or, or anything, it might take a little bit more effort than usual, but I think there are plenty of companies out there trying to help. Are you seeing any for for new 
boat buyers that are looking to get insurance now, are you seeing any impact or delays or increase in premiums moving forward? Um, interesting. Well, as you can imagine, we're, we don't have a tremendous influx of uh, yeah. actual new, new transactions right now, but, um, but there are some out there big, on bigger stuff and smaller stuff that, that are out there lingering that we're getting quotes on. And um, what, you know, insurance companies are being cautious about boats who say they're going to be north this summer or who were supposed to go to the med or who have a you know big cruising itinerary to cruise the Caribbean through the summer months, um, it's just very hard to underwrite right now because nobody knows what's what, what's going to happen. But over the last few years, our the marine insurance industry has taken a pretty big hit after all of the hurricanes, the yacht fires, the Lurson fire. It's 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 a tough time in marine insurance already. And then we had Dorian. And we were thinking, okay, Dorian's gone. Maybe by the Palm Beach show, we'll have a couple of new markets for yacht, yacht insurance. Uh, rates might drop a little, and then th this comes around. So it's just been one thing after another for marine insurers. Um, but there are options out there. Everybody's boat is insurable. So no matter what your circumstance, you can get insurance. Um, if you're working with a marine insurance specialist, there's plenty of us out there. You should be able to get your boat insured you shouldn't be under any circumstance where you're uninsurable for whatever you want to do this summer. Do you, do you see it all with a, with a larger concentration of boats in South Florida that there's um, that that'll have any, you know, is there going to be an issue with that just from a risk? Uh, yeah. From like a risk per perspective. Yeah, of course. Like I, I mentioned earlier, I mean, the, the idea here is no insurance company wants to have all their eggs in one basket, right? You mm -hmm. don't want to insure every boat at Bahia Mar and no other boats in Florida. You don't want to insure all the boats on Lake Michigan, all the boats in San Diego. You want to have a little bit everywhere. You want to have a good spread of risk, uh, some in the Med, some in the US, some in Mexico, and that keeps you pretty well balanced, almost like a stock portfolio per se. Um, and so you got to have your risk spread. And so if you end up with all of your risk or a good portion of it in one location, especially during hurricane season, it's going to cause big problems. Uh, it's, it's, it's really going to be a, a potential issue for to see what insurance companies will do. And, and underwriters have this thing called aggregate. So they can only write, like I mentioned, so much, uh, such a large value in one location, 50 million, 100 million, $500 million worth of boats in one location. If they exceed that, they have the ability to say, no, sorry, that even though we want to help you, Mr. Carlson, we don't have the, the capacity, the ability to write your boat in Florida this summer. So, uh, but if, you, if you're a boat owner who told them you were going to be here this summer and you've already got coverage for it, it won't be a problem for you because they've already accounted for that exposure. This is just for boats who can't make their original plans or want to change. So as I said before, the owners who are on top of this now um, and reaching out now are probably gonna have more options and more flexibility than the boats who wait till the end of May and the insurance companies have already exhausted their capacity in Florida for the boats they've already approved to stay. And what about with charter boats, John? Is how, how is um, insurance impact? You know, I know a lot of charters have obviously been canceled due to travel restrictions and, and whether owners just not wanting to have people on board their boats and for other reasons. But how is, um, for boats that are, that were active in charter, how is that, uh, had an, is, have their premiums gone down because the boats are are no longer being chartered currently, or what has that done uh, to insurance? What an interesting time! I feel terrible for a lot of the, the charter brokers and managers out there. Um, that's just this has just put such a damper on the charter season, and of course the owners as well. Um, you know, there were some auto insurers who were doing the you know refund my clients some premium because they're not driving their cars. Um, but one of my colleagues, Chris, brought up the example of, well, because we're not in our cars, but we're staying in our houses more now, should we increase our homeowner's premium because we're staying at home all day now? And so because they decreased the auto, no, they wouldn't do that. In marine insurance, um, I have seen some examples of insurance companies giving credits for what's called a layup or port risk credit for a boat um, who was supposed to be doing extensive navigation and now is staying in one spot. But if you were supposed to be up north in the summer and you're, in, you're going to end up in Florida, 
whether you're using your boat or not, that your price is going to go up, unfortunately. But some insurance companies are allowing you to drop your charter coverage for the year. If you remove charter coverage, you can possibly get a credit for that, depending on which insurance company you're with. Um, and there's also a coverage on a lot of the yacht policies called loss of charter. Uh, it's very similar to business interruption coverage, which many of our businesses also didn't have this coverage. Even if you had business interruption coverage, uh, this COVID-19 for most isn't covered, although there's lawsuits out there against insurers. Um, but loss of charter is the same. So if you book a, a flight on AmericanAirlines.com and you buy the $50 travel insurance, if you cancel your trip, that's if you get sick you get reimbursed. That's not if you don't want to get sick. So the loss of charter for your, for your yacht policy, this is not charter cancellation, the loss of charter, that will only cover your lost charter if there was actually a claim to the boat. The boat got struck by lightning, the boat ran aground, and now we can't go on our executed charter. Uh, so you would get a reimbursement from the insurance company. But in a, in a circumstance like this, this isn't, this isn't an occurrence per se. Um, maybe if your captain got COVID-19 and the boat can't go charter, perhaps there could be a coverage there because there's a, an actual event. But unfortunately, most owners aren't, aren't able to take advantage of the loss of charter coverage either right now. But there is trip cancellation, charter cancellation coverage that you can purchase for your charter, kind of hedge your bet a little bit. And there's also cancel for any reason insurance uh, to really hedge your bet. It's a little bit more expensive, but you could cancel for any reason as opposed to uh, essentially losing your deposit probably. All right, yeah. That's all right. So John, just as, as we sort of wrap this up, if, if you're an existing owner right now, what are like a couple of tips that you could do um, now just to check on your insurance or if someone's looking at yeah, changing their policy or, or what have you? Uh, the best action? thing is, you could do now. the best thing is to, uh, is to start the process early and give your insurance company something to work with. So go to them with your problems but also be ready to create some. So it's going to be stuck in Florida and Fort Lauderdale. Maybe you bring it up river. If you're going to be stuck in the Gulf, maybe you bring it inland a little further. Maybe you hire a captain. Uh, if your boat is down here, go to your insurance company with a hurricane plan to make yourself look more prepared, make them want to help you. They do want to help, but you have to present a good case for them regardless of what that is. So, but the earlier you start, the better chance you're going to have. And who knows, all this might blow over in a month and we might all, this all might be irrelevant by the time hurricane season comes. But have this as a plan B just in case. If, if this COVID, could these COVID closures go for a few, several more months, uh, you're going to wish that you made a few phone calls in April. Okay, so one last uh, question, and we'll, we'll take any more questions if someone has it, but we're, uh, we're getting ready to wrap this up. But one last question from Stephen for right now would be, would my insurance allow me to go north as planned just a little bit later on? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and the answer is yes, comma, probably. Uh, again, this, every, every decision depends on which insurance company you're with. So you could ask the same question to two different insurers and have two different answers. Um, but typically June 1st is the day, uh, some insurance companies, it's July 1st, some it's July 15th. So some owners just by coincidence might have more time here to go North, um, depending on who they're insured with. Historically, uh, the more active part of hurricane season is later in the summer. So that is to all, everybody's benefit here. I think uh, a suggestion of mine to the insurance companies, remember I'm just a broker to the insurance companies would be. Just push, push that date, push it from June 1st till July 1st would give owners so much more breathing room than trying to take everything on a case by case basis through May and June and ch transferring policies, changing coverage. If everyone could just push that date. So it is typically uh, possible to purchase more dates back. So if you wanna stay all of June, all of July, all of August, you can usually buy that coverage back. Usually they don't do it for free, but it's typically not a problem to obtain. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, I know it does, unless uh, Stephen, there's anything else you wanna to add to that. Can you remind everyone too, so the start and end date for hurricane season from an insurance uh, point of view? Yeah, um, again, the start date is, is yeah, I know. target June 1st till July 15th. Most insurers, it's June 1st. 
uh, and the end is, is November 1st. So <clears throat> I think the end of hurricane season, we'll deal with that when we get there. Um, but initially, just keep in mind, you don't have to be all the way up north where your boat is supposed to be. Just be north of the line that they require you to be. So if you have to be north of Florida, Georgia border, just get to Georgia and you're in compliance with your policy. If you have to be north of Cape Hatteras, get to North Carolina, you'll be in compliance just because your, your marina all the way up north in Maine isn't open or may not be open doesn't mean you can't sa satisfy the requirements of your insurance policy. All right, well, that's good. Well, yeah, I really appreciate your time, uh, your time, John, and I think that's some good insight and some good tips for owners to start checking out their insurance policies now and be ready for hurricane season in addition to managing this um, pandemic. So, yeah, again, appreciate you being here. Thanks, Mike. I uh, look forward to when my beard looks like yours, buddy. <laughs> yes, John, thank you so much. That was, uh, that was great. And thank you all for, for joining us today. We'll be back next week, Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, you can catch all of our webinars on our YouTube channel. Next week, we've got a great webinar planned. We'll be speaking with a, a well-known European shipbuilder about the impact they're seeing from COVID-19 and also some of the opportunities that have presented themselves in the new construction sector. So on that note, thank you all again and see you next time. Thanks guys. Thanks, guys.